morning. Good to have you here today for our Spiritual Encouragement Conference. It's been a good start so far with the concert last night and then the Bible class hour. We're looking forward to the week ahead of us. But we're going to go ahead and get started. We'll have a word of prayer and then we'll sing a couple songs. And then we're going to just turn it over to Bruce and Sammy and let them do their thing. So let's pray and uh, we'll get rolling here this morning. Father, we thank you for this morning and thank you for this day and thank you for this conference. We pray that you'd bless now uh, this morning in a special way that you'd help us walk with you in a greater way that we'd be inspired by thy word that you may be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and stand. We'll sing our first couple songs. Our first song this morning, we'll be turning to song number 134 in our songbooks, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of My Anchor Holds, song number 134. turning to song number 262 in our songbooks, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of The Light of the World is Jesus, song number 262. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin, the light of the world is Jesus, like sunshine at noonday. His glory shone in the light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. Darkness have we who in Jesus abide. The light of the world is Jesus. We walk in the light when we follow our guide. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light. 
is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. No need of the sunlight in heaven, we are told. The light of the world is Jesus. The Lamb is the light in the city of gold. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, it is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. good to have you here today for the start of our spiritual encouragement conference. It has been a blessing so far with the Fry Brothers with us, and we look forward to all the events that are going to be surrounded with that. Of course, we'll be hearing from them in just a moment. They'll sing for us and be preaching for us uh, this morning, tonight, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night as well. So we're excited all that the Lord has for us, and I encourage you to be faithful and allow the Lord to speak to you through the messages. I just want to go through a few of the announcements. Our weekly memory verse is 2 Corinthians 1, 4. It, it mentions here, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. And I thank God for verses like that in the sense that uh, God provides comfort for us. And this conference, it's an encouragement conference. I know we've had people going through trials and different things like that. And you need the comfort that comes from God because then you can comfort somebody else and you can be a blessing to somebody else. And that's a blessing that when you know that the things that you experience from God, you can help another person. You know, one of the greatest re ways of pulling yourself out of being down and depressed and all these kinds of things is helping somebody else Amen. and being a blessing to somebody else. Too often when we get that attitude, it's because we have, we have really gotten self-centered and self-focused and it's become all about me. But, but if we can be people who learn to get our comfort from God, it'll give you, give you some strength and uh, you'll be able to help somebody else. And I'm thankful for that truth. Good verse to put the memory uh, this week in light of our conference. Upcoming events, we have, uh, we actually don't have it in the bulletin. I, it was an oversight on my part, but this upcoming weekend, uh, next weekend is Memorial Day weekend. It's hard to believe that's kind of the unofficial start of summer. But uh, also, I do always encourage you, if you are able to get to one of those memorial services that are in our communities, we want to remember those who bled and died uh, for the sake of our nation. And uh, Memorial Day is for that point. So if you can get out to one of those, I know most communities have something that goes on. I encourage you to do that next weekend or Monday next week. Uh, June 11th is the not too far away, and that's our next peers outing. That's for our college, career age, and teenager group, if, you, if I can put it that way. Uh, that'll be at 10 o'clock in the morning until about 1.30 in the afternoon. They'll be walking and hiking, and it'll be alongside, Lord willing, some uh, some of our uh, international students that we've been reaching out to, and uh, we want to pray that uh, God will use that in a, in a unique way as an outreach opportunity, but also a fellowship time. And if you plan on going that, please sign up and be, if you would, on the sign-up sheet in the hallway. And then also that day will be our Live Fellowship for our ladies 50 years of age and older. That'll be at 10 o'clock in the morning here at the church, and I encourage you, if you are in that in that uh, category, uh, please be part of that and enjoy that time of fellowship and, and and prayer together. June 19th, Father's Day, and that we that day we will have a special gift for all fathers that are present on that Sunday. So uh, please uh, encourage you to bring Dad here. And then July 3rd, uh, the 4th of July weekend, I guess you could say, yeah, we will have a grill out after the morning service, kind of have a nice time of fellowship afterwards. We will have our evening service. Uh, we won't have it after the, the meal, but uh, anyways, uh, we plan to have uh, burgers and um, and hot dogs, things like that, that we'll grill. But what we're going to ask folks to do is bring a side dish of some sort. If you want to bring beans, you want to bring a salad, you want to bring fruit, you want to bring uh, something else, whatever, whatever you want to. 
please uh, do so if you would, and we'll have a good time of fellowship that day. And then, of course, July 4th, Independence Day, as we celebrate our nation's birthday. Missionary of the Month, we are focusing on uh, missionary uh, Stephen Terrell family. They are in the country of Iraq, and uh, we want to pray for them, of course, that the Lord will continue to use them as they minister in the city of Baghdad of all places they're in, in a very hostile part of the world and uh, we have they have some prayer requests and praises that you can take note of in the bulletin um, praying for the world I hope I'm saying this right but I think it's uh, Tuvalu I think it's how it's pronounced it's a little island country I'm guessing it's in the Caribbean uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure some of the I'm, I'm learning places all the time as we do all these different places in the world but anyways it's a small small island nation there about 12,000 people live there and we want to pray for those who are not saved there that they would come to know Christ as Savior this week with the conference we will not have our zoom prayer call at seven o'clock as we normally do on Tuesdays but we do want to I do want to encourage you to be uh, fair, or faithful in praying for your time slots for our GAP standards. We uh, will, after the conference here, once we get into the summer, we're going to actually update our, our prayer list there. But our goal is to get to a point where we have 24 hours of continuous prayer from midnight to midnight on Tuesdays. And we have different slots that people have been taking. I hope that you've been faithful in that. But uh, we will update the list here coming up here in the next week or two where you can re-sign up and all, all that kind of stuff. But we want to continue to saturate things with prayer, especially this conference. I hope that you prayed last night that God would use this conference in a special way. Please pray throughout the, this week and as we want God to meet with us and, and God to speak to our hearts about needs that we have uh, and uh, that he has solutions for, guidance for, whatever it is. As Brother Bruce mentioned during the 10, 930 hour, he talked about we want to be obedient to what God is speaking to us about. And what is it that God is speaking to us about? What's the need and uh, what, what's the direction, whatever it is? May we be faithful and may we be responsive to that. Amen. Well, I'm going to be quiet. Um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take up our offering. And if you, five brothers want to come, and if you could do the offertory and then just three other songs beside that, we certainly appreciate it. And then I believe it's Sammy is up tonight uh, at this hour for, for the message, so we're looking forward to that. But I'll go ahead and pray. I'll let these guys get up here, and then we'll take our offering. Father in heaven, today we thank you for the privilege of being here. Thank you for this conference. Thank you for these men who've traveled and all the different things that they had to go through just to get here. And we're so grateful for the opportunity, Lord God, to be able to um, worship together today and get our eyes on Thee more than anything else. And Lord, we need You today. We need You to speak to us. We need You to, to meet with us. And we ask that You would do so in a very vibrant way. Lord God, I pray You bless this offertory now as uh, we, we give and we... Uh, of the tithe and the offering may you use what's given here for the furtherance of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song uh, that's on the children's CD. God still cares for me in the chorus. The first time we say that, you say hallelujah, and the second time you say amen. All right. I know we've done this here before, so hopefully you'll just fall in there with us. Story in the Bible, I know that it is true. About a man named Daniel and all that he went through. Evil men, they turned on him, threw him in the lion's den. Alone and without a friend. But the Lord, he was present, and Daniel did pray, and a miracle happened that day. God sent an angel to that den, shut the lion's mouth, and then Daniel started to sing. God still cares for me. Hallelujah. God still cares for me. Amen. When the lions round me roar, I will call upon the Lord. God still cares for me. Now the lesson of the story is very plain to see. God took care of Daniel and he'll take care of me. When the world laughs at my faith, and the choices that I made 
God still cares for me. God still cares for me. Hallelujah. God still cares for me. Amen. When the lions round me roar, I will call upon the Lord. God still cares for me. Thankful for that. Amen. Now and then an old friend of mine I've not seen for some time Will stop by and ask me Where you been? on your mind I wonder why I'm not drinking and still painting this old town red tell them I'm serving Jesus now and the old man is dead the man you see before you may look a lot the same May wear the same clothes, have the same old name, but you're looking on the outside, you could see inside instead, you would see a brand new man, cause the old man is dead. See, according to the Word of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I used to live such a wicked life. I had no hope inside. I was lost in darkness searching for the light then one night in a little church after hearing what the preacher said I gave my life to Jesus and the old man was dead the man you see before you May look a lot the same May wear the same clothes Have the same old name But you're looking on the outside You could see inside instead You would see a brand new man Cause the old man is dead You're still looking on the inside You can see inside instead You would see a brand new man but The old man is dead Thank God the old man is dead This morning we had a sweet time in Sunday school, wonderful message, and uh, some sweet uh, just praise time, some testimony time, and one of the dear ladies, I think it was one of the ladies, mentioned about the faithfulness of God, how thankful we are that uh, we love him because he first loved us, but also he's faithful to us. You know, I was in a church um, a while back, and I was, Bruce and I went to church, actually, and I was walking around meeting people, I love to do that, and there were a group of ladies, and it appeared pretty obvious that it was a group of widow ladies. And um, so I, you know, I'd love to have fun, love to meet people, enjoy people and all that. And I said, ladies, uh, I'm so glad you're here because I'm beginning a new ministry in my home church. It's a matchmaking ministry, and I need a new bevy of qualified candidates here. And you ladies look lovely, and you're all, you're dutied up there, and it looks like you may have a little money to boot. So anyway, <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, but to, to get you involved in this ministry, I need a small deposit. Check, cash, credit card will do. 
And this, this one lady looked at me. She had this white hair bob, and it started bobbing. She said, son, let me tell you something. I ain't looking, and I ain't cooking, you know. <laughs> if you'll come back tonight, you'll hear a new song. I ain't, if you'll come back, I'm going to play that tonight. But it, it just reminded me as I talked to those ladies that how faithful God is. And he really is faithful to us all, and praise the Lord for that. This song is called, He is Faithful. Jesus, my Savior, He is my Lord. My precious Redeemer, the light of the world, my hope for tomorrow, my strength for today, with grace all sufficient, whate'er come my way. He is so faithful, He is so kind. Always forgiving, time after time, ready to listen and help when I call, willing to love me each time that I fall. He is my shepherd. I shall not want my rock and my refuge in the midst of the storm my shield and my fortress so precious is he a friend like none other is Jesus to me and he is so faithful is so kind, always forgiving, time after time, ready to listen and help when I call, willing to love me each time that I fall, and ready to listen and help when I call, willing to love me each time that I fall. He is so faithful. Brother? Tall my day is at hand a little boy and his lamb make their way to the tabernacle door. As the lamb was led away, a tear streamed down his face. As he watched from a distance, you could hear him say, My little lamb cannot stay for my sin the price you must pay a sacrifice that is so great my little lamb you must go away God looked down from heaven's throne he saw us hopeless and alone to redeem us he would have to send his son as Jesus left that holy place a tear streamed down God's face all of heaven grew silent you could hear him say my precious lamb you cannot stay Man to redeem the price you must pay, my only son, I will give away, oh 
precious land You must go today Hallelujah, praise the Lamb Hallelujah, praise the Lamb And Almighty Lamb, I'm so glad you came And all my sin, you have washed away You saved my soul Now I can say, Almighty Lamb I'll see you someday, Almighty Lamb. I'll see you someday. That. The Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Would you please turn your Bibles to Psalm, uh, two places, Psalm 34. And what you, once you find your place there, go to Psalm 51, please, all right? Psalm 34 and Psalm 51. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you. Thank you for your good singing this morning. And I just want to thank the Lord again that we're able to be here. We were, and some of you heard the story uh, last night, but actually we weren't supposed to get here until 8 o'clock tonight, which would have been too late for everything. But the Lord was in His grace, worked it out for us to be here. Not only that, gave us some unusual opportunities to share Christ, uh, especially with a young man named J.D. Please pray for J.D. in the airport. So we praise the Lord for His goodness and His grace there. Bruce is going to be speaking tonight. Brother, you know yet what you're preaching on? Or is that still, you're still praying about that? He's praying, but tomorrow night I'll be preaching. I thank God for the opportunity, and tomorrow night I want to bring you a message entitled Words of Encouragement from Death Row. So I want to encourage you to come. I know it's not easy during the week. You're all busy as beavers, living life, and life is full when you don't have a, an extra meeting to go to, but I want to encourage you to come so the Lord could have an opportunity to work in our hearts together. But this morning, I want to speak a message simply entitled The Mother of All Sin. Because if we're going to be encouraged in the Lord, and that's our theme this week, we've got to be in our place, right? Because in the Christian life, the way up is down. The way up is down. So we're in Psalm 34, and again, verse 18, all right? Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is nigh or near unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. You know what, when you hear those words, I don't know about you, but how many of you here long for a broken heart? But I dare say every person in this room has experienced what it means and what it feels like to have a broken heart. Oftentimes, before blessing comes brokenness. Before blessing becomes brokenness. We don't want that, though. We want to fly on the mountain all the time. But, again, the Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart. And then we go over to Psalm 51. Psalm chapter 51, verse 17, and we read, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Now the context of Psalm 51 is David has finally come clean with God regarding his hidden sin, sin that he has covered. And friend, those who cover and hide sin, those who have secrets and keep secrets from God and from others, in their heart there's a pride problem. There needs to be a brokenness. If we're going to be encouraged in the Lord, we must be broken before the Lord. I remember David, and, and there was a time of, of, in his life where he went to a place called Ziklag for many, many, many months. And in that place, during that time, there's no record of David praying, there's no record of him writing psalms and for the Lord, but there came a day when he was facing death at the hands of his own soldiers, of his own troops, and the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. What had happened? David came to a place of brokenness where he realized that he needed the Lord. And the Lord was his only refuge, the Lord was his only help, the Lord was his only strength, and the Lord was his only hope. 
You know, the Bible says pride go up before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The fact is, be humble or you will stumble. And God can deal with us in our pride. He really can. But I'm thankful that he giveth more grace. But remember this, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. And we read that in James 4, 6. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We need him, and uh, he wants us, but we need him. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for every young person here and every adult here this morning. What a joy it is to see these children in church. Thank you, Lord, for parents and for grandparents that have a heart to influence their children for Jesus Christ, that want their children to know the truth because they know the truth will set them free and protect them from the lives of this world. And so, Lord, we worship you this morning. We praise your holy name. We thank you for your presence in us and with us. We pray for every person here from the youngest to the oldest, and especially if there's one here without Christ, that you would open their eyes this morning, that they might humble themselves. And that you'd help us all to obey you, as we heard in Sunday school, to listen today to your word, to, to be sensitive to your spirit, and to obey you and be willing to humble ourselves so that we might experience the wonderful, wonderful grace of God. Lord, I acknowledge before these dear folks here that without you I can do nothing. And I pray that you'll give me grace. I know your strength is made perfect in weakness, that we can do all things through Christ, not through self. Not through the flesh, but through Christ. Would you use us to be a blessing and a challenge? Speak this morning, Lord. Do a work that only you can do. Prepare us now for the invitation to humble ourselves and say yes to you and to obey you. Because, Lord, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Obedience is expression of love. Humility is a, the character of Christ. So help us to manifest the character of Christ today. Thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you at how you're going to work today. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. I feel led to ask you a question this morning. How many of you are willing to listen to the Word of God with your whole heart this morning? That's you. you say, Brother Sam, willing to listen. How many of you, if God speaks to your heart through His Word, through the power of His Spirit, how many of you would say, Brother Sammy, I'm willing to listen to Him with my whole heart? Amen. One last question. If He speaks to you, this morning, and I believe he will, how many of you will say, Brother Sammy, I, I'm willing to obey him. And if that means coming to an old-fashioned altar and kneeling before him, if that means sitting in my seat where I am and, and pouring my heart out to him, I'm willing to obey him this morning. Is that you? We can't answer any more than that. You know, Muhammad Ali was known to be a very prideful athlete. Now, he, he backed up his words. I will say that. He really did. He was an incredible, incredibly gifted athlete. He was in an airplane one day, and, and uh, they, had, they were flying, and they were 32,000 feet in the air, and suddenly they experienced some turbulence, and the pilot came on the intercom. The pilot came on the intercom and said, Ladies and gentlemen, please buckle your seatbelts for your safety and the safety of others. We're experiencing some turbulence, in, experiencing some turbulence here, and we want you to be safe. And, and so click, people clicked up, buckled up. The stewardess, as they always often do, walked down the aisle, looking left, looking right. She came to Muhammad Ali, and he had not buckled his seatbelt. And he, he looked at her, and she looked at him, and she said, Sir, would you please buckle your seatbelt? And he, with, with, as only who could, he could, he said, Lady, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she very quickly responded, That's true, sir, but Superman don't need no airplane either. Buckle your seatbelt. <laughs> <laughs> but on a more serious note, Hank Gathers of Loyola Marymount University was one of the best college players in the nation. It was during the 1988-1989 season. He was the second player in NCAA history. Can you tell I enjoy sports and athletics? And I don't love boxing like Bruce does, but I enjoy hearing about it. But I love basketball. But this guy was an incredible basketball player. He was the first, the, only the second player in history to lead all players in both scoring and rebounding in the same year. This guy was something. His next season, his senior year, that was a junior season, mind you, the Lions basketball team was even better and won the regular season conference championship. Before a conference tournament game at the end of the season, Gathers was being interviewed by a reporter, which happened regularly because he was such a star, and he said to that reporter these words, and I quote, God couldn't guard me tonight. You hear that? God 
couldn't guard me tonight. Just minutes into the game, he scored on a fast break dunk. He was smoking already. And then he collapsed on the floor. Paramedics were unable to revive him, and the 23-year-old was pronounced dead on arrival at the arrival of the hospital. He had been suffering from an irregular heartbeat, but because he felt like the medication that had been prescribed was hindering his athleticism, he decided to stop taking the medicine, and which led to his early death. God couldn't guard me tonight. What was at the heart of those words? Pride. Pride. We all deal with it, don't we? But, you know, here's the question this morning. Who is the person that God uses? Who is the person that God can take and, and, and do incredible things with? Is it the person that has the most natural ability? Not necessarily. That can be used, of course. But I believe this. It's the person who is willing to humble himself before God. Moses grew up in Pharaoh's home. Incredible education, incredible opportunities. One day, two Hebrews were, were, were not getting along and some things were going on and, and, um, and, and uh, there was about a fight there and Moses killed a man. If I have my story right there, my mind's just slipping a little bit there, but the p bottom line is Moses killed a man. Well, Pharaoh heard about it and he was not happy and Moses had to run for his life. It was as if he was saying to the Hebrew nation at that time, Here am I! I'm the deliverer. Well, what happened then in his life? Moses spent 40 years in the desert. And then when God appeared to him out of a burning bush and called him to deliver the nation Israel, did he say, here am I? No. You know what he said? He said, who am I? After 40 years in the desert, he was finally ready because the way up is down. And the man God uses, the woman God uses, is the person who's willing to humble themselves before God. What is the mother of all sin? Andrew Murray said that pride is the root of every sin and evil. Christentum, an early church leader, said pride is the mother of all evils. That's where I got my title. The question is, not do I have it, this thing of pride, but where is it and how much of it do I have? And I looked up the word pride in my 1828 Webster Dictionary that has Mr. Webster's personal testimony in the front of that Bible. That's long been erased and taken out. Here's what I read about pride. It's an inordinate self-esteem, an unreasonable conceit of one's own superiority in talents, beauty, wealth, accomplishments, rank or elevation in office, which manifests itself in lofty airs, distance reserved, and often in contempt of others. Then he references Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction. Wow. But let's press forward and move forward to 1969 Webster's Dictionary. And here's what I read in the definition. The quality or state of being proud, excessive self-esteem, reasonable, of justifiable self-respect. Do you see the difference? 1828, pride wasn't a wonderful thing. 1969, everybody needs some pride. It's justifiable, self-respect. The fact is, pride has lost its, its negative connotations. No wonder our world today promotes self-esteem, gay pride, and on and on and on we could go. Martin Luther said this, I'm more afraid of Pope self than of the Pope in Rome and all his cardinals. Jonathan Edwards said this, It takes many forms and shapes and encompasses the heart like the layers of an onion. When you pull off one layer, there is another underneath. Now, the danger at this moment in time, in this message in time, is this. Somebody's thinking, boy, I'm glad they're here. I'm glad they're here to hear this. I hope they're tuned in online. No, there's something wrong with that thinking. This is not for someone else to consider. This is for me. This is for you. This is, I want this to be personal to our hearts. My desire is that God, through the mirror of his word, will speak to every single heart here and help us to draw nigh unto him that he might draw nigh unto us. Vernon McGee said, attitude of heart, pride is the attitude of heart that says, I can and will live without God. I love this statement. Pride is the only disease known to man that makes everyone sick but the one who has it. I say this. Did y'all have dandelions up here? Do you have dandelions? Well, we have dandelions down there too. And I, this is my quote for posterity, right? Of course, not really. Pride is like dandelions. It grows everywhere, and it's hard to kill, and you have to get the root, okay? 
C.S. Lewis said, Pride is the essential vice, the utmost evil, the one vice of which no man in the world is free and of which hardly any people ever imagine they are guilty themselves. Coach Pat Riley, Riley once called pride the disease of me. Charles Spurgeon said, Pride is the firstborn son of hell. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said, Pride is a stone over which many people stumble. I believe that pride is a sinful condition of the human heart that we might call idolatry of self. Thou shalt have no other gods before thee. And too often, I wrestle with the God in the mirror, the little g God in the mirror, self, Sammy. It's a, it's a situation where the individual lives independent of God and is dependent on self. The sin of pride is the violation, as I've just mentioned of the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before you. John Bright said it this way to sum it up. He is a self-made man, and he worships his creator. But what's the cause of pride? Friends, pride was born in the heart of an angel. It turned an angel into a devil. You can read about that in Isaiah 14. The Lord says to him, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. And in the heart of an angel was born the heart of the devil. Lucifer. In Genesis 3, we see the temptation in the garden where Adam and Eve were tempted in pride to live apart from God, to do their own thing, to disobey the word of God, and to become, as it were, little gods, but it was a lie. It was deceit. Yea, hath God said, Satan is a liar. He's a liar from the beginning, and he's a murderer. And from that sin, from that temptation, came this desire to be like God. Remember, the one who wanted to be worshipped as God tempted Adam and Eve to be as little gods, and they sinned against God, and death was born. Death was born. You know, it was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It's a completely anti-God state of mind. And we see as a result of the fall of man, kind of summed up in Romans 5.12, a familiar verse, well for, as by one man sin he entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Lust, sin, death. Satan's LST, LSD. When lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. Sin, when it's been finished, brings forth death. What was the lust in heaven that Lucifer had? He wanted to be worshipped. What was the lust in Adam and Eve's heart in the garden? They wanted to be as God. What is the lust in your heart that causes you fits? Is it to be respected? Is it to be known? What is it? But one thing we know, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. See, in our world today, it's not amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You know what it is today? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a winner like me. No, no. John Newton got it right, didn't he? We sing that song. But how many of us have ever seen ourselves as a wretch? That, that doesn't even sound good. But it's the truth. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody had to teach you how to sin. Nobody had to teach me how to sin. It's as natural as breathing. Nobody has to teach me how to lie. My daddy didn't sit down with me and say, Son, let me just tell, tell you, give you some wisdom for the ages. There are three categories of lies. There's a, there's a little gray lie here. That'll get you out of trouble in a jam. There's a little white lie. That'll, that'll do this for you. And there's this serious lie, this bold-faced lying. No, he didn't do that at all. But I knew how to lie when I was a baby. Before I could talk, I could lie. My mama would put me in the crib. I'm wet. I'm dry. I'm fed. I'm happy. And she'd walk out of the room, and she would run back in thinking a rattlesnake just bit me because I'm screaming. I'm lying. I want her. I want to comfort her arms. You know, I was being deceitful. You know, every man, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. We, we're born with a propensity for pride and for deceitfulness. Charles Spurgeon, 
said that demon of pride was born with us and it will not die one hour before us. It is so woven into the very warp and woof of our nature that till, till we are wrapped in our winding sheets, we shall never hear the last of it. So the cause of pride is the fall of man and the sin nature that we all deal with daily, even as believers, that flesh can be so powerful and so real. But what's the character of pride? This is the time where we take inventory and we look at ourselves. Number one, one of the character, I'm not, I don't have time to go into all these, but one of the characters of pride in the life of a person is a person who is unsubmissive to authority. They're unsubmissive. Listen to these words in Colossians 3. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it, is, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Submissiveness was the character of Jesus Christ. And to the wives, it is not a dirty word to be submissive. It is a Christ-honoring biblical command that you can only do by the grace of God as you obey your husband and in so doing, you trust God through him. I know that's challenging. That has got to be incredibly challenging, but God can give you the grace to do that. Why is it so important? Because your husband needs your respect. You want to respect your husband? You know one way you do that? You trust him. You trust him, his judgment, even when you believe he's wrong. You have every right to share your feelings and your thoughts with him. Honey, I don't believe this is the right decision, but I'm going to follow you. Unless he's going against the word of God, then you have the right to say, no, I will not follow you. You have that right. But ladies, submit yourself to your own husband. Not to your boyfriend, but to your own husband as unto the Lord. But hus husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, you don't know my wife, but I know the word. But my wife, she, she doesn't treat me right. God says, love your enemies. You don't have any excuse. Well, you know what? Sometimes God says, love your neighbor. Stop it. I don't want to hear more excuses. Hus love your wives as Christ loved the church. Children, you know, we're so quick to have our children memorize that verse while they're in the womb. Don't we, though? You know, children, obey your parents. And, Lord, how you get that? <laughs> I want you to know that. And, um, but you know what? The same mother that says, children, obey your parents in the Lord and demands obedience from her children will not submit to her husband. The same husband that will demand his children to obey him will not love his wife as Christ loved the church. And you know what we're doing when we do that? We're producing frustration. Because it's as if call, trying to call your children to a place where you're not. And they can see. Children are smart. They're, they have a lot of intuition. They know what's going on. Some of you have dealt with that in your life. But I'll tell you, one of the marks of a prideful generation, and are we not seeing that in America today across our land? Unsubmissiveness to civil authorities, to the police. Listen, there are bad cops. There are bad preachers. There are husbands that aren't the best. But listen, there are times to, to get involved in the legal process, process, but a lot of the problems we see in America today are simply because people will not obey the authorities. Regardless of race, gender, and all that business that takes place. Truly humble people will, will not rebel against those that have been placed in authority over them. And the Bible says, even in the context of the church, there are authorities. Listen to this in 1 Thessalonians 5. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. We're to obey spiritual authorities. That doesn't mean we're to blindly obey pastors and, 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 and those in authority, but we are to obey them and submit to them until they're violating the word of God. But one of the marks, one of the marks of pride is an unwillingness to be submissive. You always have a better answer. You always know the better way. Your way or the highway. You know what, Samson, what did Samson lose in his life at the end of his life? I want you to help me. Please help me. Just let's talk for a minute, okay? We're family, right? Somebody tell me, what did Samson lose at the end of his life? What's one thing he lost? He lost his eyesight. Did he have a problem with his eyes? For years, he had a problem with his eyes. 
The Lord said, well, you know, we're going to take care of that. What else did he lose? Anybody, help me out here. What else did he lose? The individual. He lost his strength. What else did he lose? His life. He lost Delilah. Where were his parents? They weren't with him. Did he lose his testimony? And he ultimately lost his life. Where did it all begin, young people? Young people, will you listen to me for a minute, kids? You know where it all began? When he wouldn't listen to mom and dad. That's where it all started. He had this habit of wanting to do what he wanted to do, when he wanted to do it, where he wanted to do it, and how he wanted to do it. That's where it began. He was unsubmissive. Also, those who are prideful are unteachable. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Do you know anyone, and you just can't tell them anything? They always know the better way. Moses and Aaron were before Pharaoh. And listen to these words. Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? That was God's word to Pharaoh. He wouldn't listen. He was unteachable. How about unforgiving? Proud people expect to be treated a certain way, and when they aren't, look out. Look out. You'll hear words like this. I don't deserve this. It's not fair. My friend, Pastor David Jackson, was uh, candidating at a church in Goldsboro, North Carolina, and he went there, and he was, went, across, went to a restaurant across from the motel he was staying in, and he told me, he said, she was the rudest waiter, waitress I'd ever had in my whole life. She was unkind. She would throw the, just slid the food on the, on the table and threw down the silverware, and she wouldn't come back and fill up his drink. And he said, finally, he said, it just ruined my meal. I can't wait to get out of here. And, but he got ready to leave, and he said the Lord impressed on his heart to leave her a $20 tip. Now, he was having this conversation in his heart, and his response, he told me, was this. No, Lord, I'm not going to do it. She has been the worst waitress I've ever had in my life. And he just, this, this strong impression, wasn't a voice that he could hear, but was so strong, he said, okay, Lord. So he threw the $20 bill on the table. He walked up to pay his bill, just glad to be leaving, and somebody tapped on his shoulder. It was that waitress with that $20 bill in her hand. And she said, sir, I know there must be a mistake this $20 bill on your table. And he said, no, ma'am, it's not a mistake. She said, this is a tip? He said, yes, ma'am. She said, sir, I, I know I didn't treat you very well today. I wasn't kind. He said, you got that right. He said, you're the worst waitress I ever had in my life. He told her that. And he said, but I didn't leave you because you were a great server today. I left you that because God impressed on my heart that he wanted me to give you a $20 tip. She started crying. Her husband had just left her with two children. She was working two jobs just trying to pay the bills. He wasn't helping her at all. Do you think God gave him an opportunity to share with her in that moment? Yeah. Because he was humble enough to be obedient. He did it with some reservation and some resistance, but he was willing to obey the Lord. You see, proud people are unforgiving. They really are. Proud people have an uncontrolled tongue and an uncontrolled temper. You know, the Bible says only by pride cometh contention. There are problems in your life, in your relationships. Somebody's got a pride problem. Only by pride cometh contention. That's God's word. Those are not my words, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Proud people are ungrateful. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 and 2, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. At Christmas time, some folks are so busy looking at what everybody else got, they don't enjoy what they got. When I worked in a corporate America, it was amazing to me. At every end of every year, we got these bonuses, and there were men who got thousands of dollars in, in money, but they were unhappy because somebody in the office next door got a little bit more than them. And they were bitter and grumbling and couldn't enjoy what they had received. Proud people have a difficult time being glad for the success or blessings of others. Somebody pulls up in a brand new car at the church. Well, bless their hearts. Praise the Lord. They got a new car. That's great. Can I smell it? I mean, you know, you know, uh, you know. Or somebody walks in with a brand new dress. Well, isn't she beautiful? I'm so happy for them that they got that. That's just so great. <sighs> Maybe not, huh? Maybe not. 
God, help us to be humble, to be grateful. Proud people are uninhibited. They'll do anything to get attention. Man, I was in high school, and a friend of mine was walking down the hall one day, and he said, hey, Sammy, you won't believe what I just did. I said, what'd you do? He said, I jumped out of the two-story bathroom window. I said, are you crazy, and you lived? He said, yeah, man, you jump out, and you grab this tree. It'll let you all the way to the ground, and then, then boing, you know, it's so much fun. I said, really? I want to do that. So, so I go to the window. It's just me and him. I climb out on the ledge. I jump. I grab the tree. Down we go. Boing. That was fun. I did it again. I'm walking through the halls. The kids coming up to me in the hall said, Hey, did I hear you jumped out of the... Yeah, man, I did. It was fun. You ought to try it. He said, Would you do it again? I said, What for? I've done it twice. He said, We'll pay you. You'll pay me to do what I did twice just for fun? Sign me up, you know. <laughs> so lunchtime comes, and I come out, I get to the window, and I climb out on the ledge, and there's 200 young people out there watching. <laughs> but hey, this is my show. This is my time. But I suddenly got real nervous, and I had a change of heart, okay? And I turned, and there were some guys in the window behind me. I said, fellas, I think I'm going to change my mind on this. He said, you're not coming back in this window. It was a football team, players, you know. I said, okay. So I turned and jumped. I must have closed my eyes. I hit the top of the tree, did two somersaults going down, landed on the back of my head. It knocked me out cold, but I made $5.32. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. We got off the school bus that day, and Bruce said, well, hey, and I showed him on this piece. He said, man, you got all you know, wow, you know. I got in trouble with the principal again. My high school principal told me, he said, I never thought you'd amount to anything. And you know, you know what my problem was? Some of y'all went, had the same principles as me, didn't you? I can tell. And uh, I was full of Sammy. Wanted to be seen. Wanted to be noticed, you know. Yeah, buck teeth, bald head, skinny, short, last name, fright. Yeah, I wanted to be seen. And can you believe that? Prideful people are unkind. Did you know that? I read about Donald Trump and Rosie O'Donnell's War of Words. And I've thought about Proverbs 12, 18. I don't know if you remember that that went on. Listen to this. There is that speaking like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Proud people can have black belts in verbal karate. They can tear people up with their words. There's, you know, words corrupt communication. Ephesians 4 talks about it. It can be like shrapnel to your heart. It can leave wounds that nobody can see, but they don't go away. There are some of you here, and you remember even now, as you, when you were children, there were people that said words that encouraged your heart. But there are some of you here who heard words as children that wounded your heart, and you can still remember. Maybe you can remember them without pain, but you can still remember because death and life are in the power of the tongue. And prideful people don't mind cutting people with their tongue. What are the consequences? We've seen the cause and the character. Number one, pride disgusts God. Listen to this. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5. Psalm 119, 21. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Pride disgusts God, friend. Pride is destructive to your life, to your testimony. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, Proverbs 18, 12 says, and before honor is humility. Quote this verse with me. We all know it probably, Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Oh, there's so many stories. Haman, the man who hung himself, was full of pride, angry because Mordecai wouldn't bow before him. Thomas Watson said it this way, the proud man is the mark which God shout, shoots at, and he never misses the mark. If that didn't convince you, listen to Proverbs 15, 25. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud. Pride will defeat your life. It will destroy your testimony. Pride met humility one day. His name was Goliath. Mr. Prideful Goliath. He met humble David. And that day, the giant fell and lost his head. He didn't blaspheme God anymore after that day because pride does go before destruction. 
Pride is so deceiving. You know, I read an article about a linebacker at Wake Forest University, and he was quoted, listen to this quote, staying humble is something we pride ourselves on. <laughs> Do you like that? <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I read that. Staying humble is something we pride ourselves on. So what's the cure? We're going to wrap this up. You've heard preachers say that before, haven't you? Um, what's the cure? We need to look at the humility of Jesus Christ. Bruce referenced this morning, Philippians 2, verse 8. He humbled himself and became obedient to the cross. Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, humbled himself. And I want to share something with you that just came to my mind sitting up there as Bruce was singing in John chapter 13. Now listen to this. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus... Jesus, I love Jesus. Do you love Jesus? I love Jesus. I love his word. This is his word, his love letter. In front of my Bible, I wrote, Dear Sammy. At the end, I wrote, Love God. I love Jesus. I don't always live like I ought. I don't always love him as I ought, but I do love him. I'm so thankful to him. And listen, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Don't miss this. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he was come from God and went to God. Now here we read, Jesus, knowing the Father had given all things into his hands. All authority, all power, the world, the universe, it's all His. What would you do if God said to you, all things are in your hands? You can have it all. You want an island? You can have it. What kind of vehicle do you want? You can have a fleet. You want this? You want that? It's all yours. What would be your next decision? Watch this. Knowing that His Father had given all things under His hands, and He was come from God and went to God, He riseth from supper and laid aside his garment, and took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. When he declared that he knew all things were given unto him, his next action was the lowest action anybody could perform in that culture. It was to wash the feet of the disciples, those feet that in a very short time were going to depart from him and flee for their lives. We're going to leave him to face the cross alone. Humility. When we see his humility, why is it I have such a problem when somebody pulls out in front of me on the highway? Why don't I say, bless their hearts, you know, I'm going to pray for them. Why is it that flesh flares? And I've done the very same thing myself because in my heart, that pride, still lurks there. It really does. We're all prone to pride. Pride is natural. Humility is supernatural. We can't take a vacation from vigilance regarding this pride that can raise its ugly heads in our hearts. We need Christ. You must be born again. If you're going to have victory, you must humble yourselves before the Lord and receive him as Savior. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I believe Christ lived, died, and rose from the dead for me, and I want you as my Savior. Please, I believe. Save me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then we must surrender ourselves. That's another choice that can happen at the moment of salvation, as it did for Bruce, as it did for Paul, but not for Sammy. I, I can handle I'm saved. I'm thankful I'm saved, 24 years old. Still a lot of me on the throne. In a year and a half, I was miserably miserable <laughs> trying to live the Christian life in my own strength. It was awful because I was saved, but I was not surrendered, and I wasn't living for his glory. I was still my glory. You know, 2 Corinthians 10, 17 says, And he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And then we must submit and confess any pride that we see in our lives. You know, sometimes we think we're doing so well, and, and yet God says he holds our breath in his hands. Can you imagine walking into a hospital room and somebody's bragging and, about how well they're breathing on life support? Are we on life support? Yep. Every breath that we breathe 
is a gift from God. Every heartbeat that we experience is a gift from God. We're all on life support, and we need to humble ourselves and put him first in our lives. We deserve judgment. He's given us mercy and grace and the promise of everlasting life. You know what I said to begin? And I'm going to do a little last follow-up here to, to wrap this up. Be humble or you will stumble. How are you doing? As I close out this message, I'm going to read through some things in a book I read by Nancy DeMoss. She's one of my favorite authors. She really is. And I want you personally to take personal inventory as you read and see if any of these characteristics you see in you. And if you do, will you consider today repenting and confessing your sin to God and asking him for the grace to change and grow and become more like Christ, the humble Savior? Proud people focus on the failures of others. But broken people are overwhelmed with a sense of their own spiritual need. Proud people are self-righteous. They have a critical fault-finding spirit. Do you have anyone like that? They look at everyone else's faults with a microscope, but they're on with a telescope, and they look down on others. But broken people are compassionate. They can forgive much because they know how much they have been forgiven. They think the best of others, and they esteem all others better than themselves. Proud people have an independent, self-sufficient spirit, but broken people have a dependent spirit and recognize their need for others. Proud people have to prove that they're right, but broken people are willing to yield the right to be right. Proud people claim rights and have a demanding spirit, but broken people yield their rights and have a meek spirit. Proud people are self-protective of their time, their rights, their reputation, but broken people are self-denying. Proud people desire to be served, but broken people are motivated to serve others. Proud people want to be a success, but broken people are motivated to be faithful and to make others a success. Proud people desire self-advancement, but broken people desire to promote others. Proud people have a drive to be recognized, to be appreciated. They're wounded when others are promoted and they're overlooked. Broken people have a sense of their own unworthiness. They're thrilled that God would use them at all in any ministry. Proud people have a subconscious feeling. This ministry is privileged to have me and my gifts. They think of what they can do for God, but broken people have the hard attitude that says, I don't deserve to have a part in any ministry. They know that they have nothing to offer God except the life of Jesus flowing through their broken lives. Proud people are confident in how much they know, but broken people are, are humbled by how very much they have to learn. Proud people are self-conscious. But broken people are not concerned with self at all. They're focused on the needs of others. Proud people keep others at arm's length, but broken people are willing to risk getting close to others and take the risk of loving intimately because you will be hurt if you're willing to open your life and heart to others. Proud people are quick to blame others, but broken people accept personal responsibility and they can see where they're wrong. Proud people find it difficult to share their spiritual needs with others, but broken people are willing to be open and transparent with others as God directs. Proud people never go to an altar. They don't want anybody to think that they have problems or that they don't have it all together. But humble people are willing to admit quickly, I don't have it all together. I'm a work in progress. I'm a construction site for Jesus. I really am. With that sign out front, this is danger, beware, you know. And uh, Proud people have a hard time saying I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? But broken people are quick to admit their failure and to seek forgiveness when necessary. Proud people are concerned about the consequences of their sins, but broken people are grieved over the cause and the root of their sin. Proud and broken people don't think they need revival, but they're sure that everybody else does. Broken, humble people know they need revival every day. And you know what the real problem is? We're often too alive, too alive to sell. You know, if someone has died, and we've had many funerals in the last two years, more than I've ever experienced or seen, but you know, if you walk up to a person in a coffin and you slap them, you know what they do? Nothing. You can shake them. You know what they do? Nothing. You can pull them up and drop them. What they do? They just fall right back down. You can call them all sorts of names. You know what they do? Nothing. You know why? Because they're dead. You know what your problem and mine is so often? We're too alive. We're too alive to self. We're too alive to our pleasure, to our possessions, 
and to our desire for position. So God help us to live dead unto Christ, but alive in Christ. Dead in our trespasses and sins, remember, but alive in Jesus Christ so that he can enjoy the liberty to work through us and in us in the lives of other people. And that will only happen when we humble ourselves before him and he gives us the grace that only he can give us. So with every head up and every eye open this morning, how many of you would say, as the pianist comes, how many of you would say, Brother Sammy, through his word and through his spirit, God has spoken to my heart this morning. Is that you? With every head up and every eye open, I want to invite something for you to do that you may not have done in a long time. I want to invite you to get up from your seat and find you a place as a place at this altar and talk to God about what he's talked to you about. If you can't kneel, I'd like you to come and sit in a seat at the front and just come. Would you please stand to your feet? Father, bless this your invitation. Help your people to humble themselves. If there's anyone here without Christ, may they humble themselves and take our hand and help allow us the privilege to lead them to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for those who are humbling themselves this Lord, may this be a church full of people who are dead to self and alive in Christ, who are willing to humble themselves and confess, perhaps even leave here husband, or go to that wife, or go to that child, or make that phone call, phone call and say, please forgive me, I've been prideful in my heart towards you, and unkind, and the things I've said or possibly done, would you help us to... To, to be clean when we leave here today and follow that decision this morning up with action that will please you. Please, Lord. Of where it took Moses 40 years to get to. Help us to live like you. To, in a sense, wash the feet of others, regardless of our position. Lord, help us to be more like you and that you would have more of us. And if we're going to be used of you to do much for you, we much, must be much with you. Help us to walk with you in humility, to every day express our humility by taking time to pray, taking time to read your word, because we know we need you. Please, Father, please. Thank you for those who have come. Will you help them at their point of need? Will you work as only you can? Will you bless this church? Will you use this time together this week to do a mighty work in every heart? Please make me first in that. So often I'm so proud, so self-sufficient. Forgive me and help me to remember that your sufficiency is what I need always. And thank you for our time together today. In Jesus' name we pray. Pastor.
I could do one good thing, but I do three, four, five other bad things. Never, you can never do enough good to outweigh your bad. But Jesus came so that you wouldn't have to work your way to heaven. But if you trust him to be your savior, turn from your sin and trust him with all your heart, confess it as what it is before God, and look to him, he'll save you. his way in our lives this week. And may he get the glory. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the message. And Lord, it's, it's a great need in our lives to be confronted with this issue. So often it's the very thing that puts a big wall between us and you and hinders us from receiving your joy within our heart, your power within our lives, your grace to fulfill your purpose. Father, today, may we have really taken heed to what was mentioned and, and Lord, continue to work in each one of our lives because you desire to use us and to bless us and to, in ways that we would never have imagined. But Lord, may our pride not get in the way of all that. Thank you, Lord God, for this morning. We look forward to the rest of the conference in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. That was, uh, that was so appropriate. <laughs> Healthful, I believe. So that, I don't like being told I'm prideful. You probably need a lot more to be told that way. <laughs> Honestly, though, if we learn to humble ourselves, we find that you know, God's grace becomes to flow into the life so much more. That joy that's missing may be the result of just simply a lack of humility. That power that's missing that we need to live the Christian life is simply oftentimes the, re the result of a lack of humility. I was reading here in the book of Genesis where, where Jacob was coming back to see his brother Esau. And Esau had uh, 400 men with him and Jacob was afraid. You know what Jacob did? He didn't go to God, God, what'd you do here? No, he humbled himself before God greatly. And... Uh, God worked a really unique opportunity, and him and Esau, his brother, that he had kind of uh, scandaled out of uh, some blessings, made up together. It's amazing. All over the Bible, you see when people humbled themselves, God did great things. Amen. And I just trust and pray that, that this morning's messages, I think they worked so well together, would be a precipice in which we would see God do some special things uh, this week. So be back tonight, 6.30. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night at 7.30, you're going to hear some wonderful preaching and some wonderful singing. And uh, make sure if you can bring a friend, try to do that as well. I think they'll be truly challenged and, and blessed by everything we hear. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and close with a word of prayer. And uh, Bruce and Sammy, they've got some CDs out there if you'd like to get some or buy some as a gift, whatever works for you. But uh, we'll make sure that it makes some time available for that. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for just the blessing it's been to be in the house of the Lord. And Lord, I know that you are working in my heart as you are in many people's hearts here today. I pray that as we continue through this conference that there would be a, a real work done that would just glorify you and that would result in much good being accomplished for the glory and kingdom of God. Thank you for this morning. We look forward to tonight and the rest of the conference. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, you are dismissed. Thank you for being here this morning.